In May 1966, the Great Northern Railway took delivery of a locomotive so powerful, they painted a nickname right on its flanks. They called it Hustle Muscle. Locomotive number 400 was the first production SD45 ever built, and it represented everything EMD believed about the future of American railroading. 20 cylinders, 3,600 horsepower, the most powerful single-engine locomotive ever created. Railroads couldn't write purchase orders fast enough. Santa Fe wanted them. Southern Pacific wanted them, Burlington Northern, Pennsylvania Railroad, Union Pacific. Every major carrier in America lined up to buy the machine that promised to revolutionize heavy freight operations. Then the crankshafts started breaking. Not occasionally, not rarely. They broke with such regularity that some railroads kept spare engines on hand, expecting to swap them into disabled SD45s, like changing batteries in a flashlight. Brand new million dollar locomotives were being towed back to shops before they'd completed a single month of revenue service. The mechanical departments that had celebrated the arrival of EMD's newest flagship watched in horror as engine after engine tore itself apart from the inside. The SD45 was supposed to cement EMD's dominance of American railroads for another generation. Instead, it became a cautionary tale that would haunt the company for decades and plant the seeds of engineering overconfidence that would eventually cost EMD its empire. This is the story of how the most powerful locomotive ever built became one of the most expensive engineering disasters in railroad history. To understand why EMD built the SD45, you need to understand the horsepower wars of the 1960s. The diesel locomotive industry had become an arms race. General Electric was pushing boundaries with their U-boat series. Alco was fighting for survival with increasingly powerful century designs. Every manufacturer believed the railroad that controlled the most horsepower would control the most freight. Bigger engines meant fewer locomotives, fewer crews, lower operating costs. EMD had dominated American railroads since the 1930s with their bulletproof two-stroke engines. The 567 series had killed steam locomotion. The 645 series that replaced it promised even greater things. When EMD's engineers looked at their new 16-cylinder 645E3 engine producing 3,000 horsepower, they asked a dangerous question, why stop there? The physics seemed simple enough. If 16 cylinders produce 3,000 horsepower, 20 cylinders should produce 3,600. Same basic engine design, same proven components, just more of them. The additional 600 horsepower would give EMD's customers unprecedented pulling power in a single locomotive frame. EMD's engineers lengthened their standard six axle frame by five feet to accommodate the massive 20-cylinder power plant. They designed distinctive flared radiator air intakes to handle the additional cooling requirements. They created a locomotive that looked like nothing else on American rails, a visual statement of raw industrial might. The first SD45 demonstrators rolled out of Lagrange in late 1965. Railroad executives who saw them were impressed. The specifications were staggering for their era, 3,600 horsepower from a single prime mover enough muscle to replace two older locomotives on demanding mountain grades. The future of freight railroading had arrived. Orders flooded in. By the time production ended in 1971, EMD had built over 1,200 SD45s. Santa Fe, Burlington Northern, Southern Pacific, and Pennsylvania Railroad each ordered more than 100 units. It was one of the most successful locomotive launches in EMD's history. Then the bills started coming due. The SD45's 20-cylinder engine didn't fail because EMD's engineers were incompetent. It failed because they underestimated the physics of what they'd built. A diesel locomotive crankshaft is a massive piece of precision machined steel that converts the explosive force of combustion into rotational energy. Every time a cylinder fires, it hammers the crankshaft with thousands of pounds of force. In a 16-cylinder engine, this happens in a carefully choreographed sequence that keeps forces balanced and stresses manageable. The 20-cylinder 645E3 changed everything. The crankshaft was simply longer, significantly longer than any locomotive engine EMD had built before. Longer crankshafts flex more under load. They develop harmonic vibrations that shorter shafts can absorb. They concentrate stress at points that shorter designs distribute evenly. The SD45's crankshaft was actually built in two pieces, bolted together in the middle. This engineering compromise spoke volumes about the challenges of creating such a massive rotating assembly. When the engine fired under full load, with 20 cylinders hammering away at 900 RPM, stress concentrated at the weakest points in the structure. 
But the crankshaft wasn't the only problem. The engine block itself was failing. EMD used welded steel construction for their engine crank cases rather than the cast iron blocks common in smaller engines. The A-frame structures that supported the crankshaft main bearings were welded into the crankcase shell. Under the brutal stresses of 20-cylinder operation, these welds developed cracks. The crankcase flexed in ways the designers hadn't anticipated. Main bearing alignment shifted microscopically, but enough to accelerate crankshaft wear. The failures were spectacular. Crankshafts didn't just crack, they broke into pieces while the engine was running. Metal fragments tore through the crank case, oil sprayed everywhere. Locomotives that had been thundering across the mainline minutes earlier suddenly died in catastrophic mechanical failure. Some failures destroyed the entire engine beyond any hope of repair. Railroad mechanical officers started keeping score. The SD45s were spending more time in shops than on the road. Maintenance costs per mile were climbing toward levels that erased any theoretical savings from the additional horsepower. The extra four cylinders that were supposed to deliver competitive advantage were delivering competitive disaster. The real nightmare wasn't just that the crankshafts broke, it was when they broke and why the railroads couldn't predict it. A locomotive pulling 15,000 tons of coal across Nebraska doesn't have the luxury of stopping when something feels wrong. The train behind it has momentum that takes miles to dissipate. The dispatcher has schedules built around that train's arrival. The crews that will take over at the next terminal are waiting. Everything in railroad operations depends on locomotives doing exactly what they're supposed to do, exactly when they're supposed to do it. SD45s had a habit of failing at the worst possible moments. The stresses that broke crankshafts were highest under full load, precisely when the locomotive was working hardest, climbing grades, accelerating heavy trains, earning its keep. An SD45 might run perfectly for weeks at partial power, then explode internally the first time an engineer called for full throttle. Railroad mechanical departments tried everything. They ran the locomotives at reduced power ratings, sacrificing the extra horsepower they'd paid for. They developed elaborate inspection protocols to catch failures before they became catastrophic. They kept spare 20-cylinder engines in stock ready to swap into disabled locomotives. Nothing worked consistently. The math that had made the SD45 so attractive on paper turned brutal in practice. A locomotive that cost a million dollars to buy but spent half its life in the shop wasn't worth the steel it was built from. Every day an SD45 sat waiting for repairs, the railroad was paying for capital that wasn't earning revenue. Every time a crankshaft failure required an engine swap, skilled mechanics were tied up for days instead of maintaining the rest of the fleet. Shop foremen started keeping lists of which locomotives to avoid assigning to critical trains. The SD45, designed to be the pride of any locomotive roster, became the machine nobody wanted to see on the call board. Meanwhile, the SD40, the SD45's less glamorous 16-cylinder sibling, ran forever on the same basic components. Railroad superintendents noticed something strange happening. The SD45's were doing exactly the same work as the SD45's, burning less fuel and never breaking down. The extra 600 horsepower looked impressive in catalogs, but meant nothing if you couldn't keep the locomotive running. The fuel situation made the math even worse. Those four extra cylinders consumed diesel, whether you needed the power or not. At partial throttle, the condition most freight locomotives operate in during cruise portions of their runs, the SD45 was feeding cylinders that contributed nothing useful. Some mechanical officers calculated that operating costs for the 20-cylinder locomotives ran 20% higher per ton mile than their 16-cylinder counterparts. At low speeds, when tractive effort was adhesion limited, the SD45 provided no advantage whatsoever over the SD40. Both locomotives put the same weight on the rails. Both had the same traction motors. The extra horsepower only helped at higher speeds, on level track, under conditions that represented a fraction of typical freight operations. The railroads had paid premium prices for capabilities they rarely needed. EMD's response to the crisis revealed both the company's engineering capability and its institutional blindness. When the crankshaft failures became impossible to ignore, EMD's engineers launched a crash redesign program. They analyzed failed components under electron microscopes. They ran computer simulations of stress distribution. They built test engines and ran them to destruction, documenting every failure mode. They brought in metallurgists to study the fracture patterns. They consulted with their marine engine customers who were running similar power plants without the same catastrophic failures. The diagnosis was clear. The A-frame structures that supported the main bearings needed to be stronger. The welding procedures that attached them to the crank case needed revision. 
the overall block structure needed stiffening to reduce flex under load, the engine's natural resonant frequency fell dangerously close to its normal operating speed, creating harmonic vibrations that propagated through the entire structure. Every component bolted to that flexing engine block absorbed those vibrations. Turbocharger mounting points cracked under constant stress. Fuel lines worked loose from their fittings. Electrical connections shook apart over hundreds of miles. The 20-cylinder engine wasn't just breaking itself, it was breaking everything attached to it. EMD implemented the fixes. They redesigned the A-frames with better stress distribution. They developed new welding procedures that eliminated the crack-prone joints. They offered policy adjustments, industry code for free repairs, to replace the problematic crankcases in the field. By the time the SD45-2 entered production in 1972, the mechanical problems were largely solved, but the damage was already done. Railroads have long memories. The purchasing agents who'd written million-dollar checks for SD45s in 1966 remembered watching those locomotives get towed back to shops in 1968. The mechanical officers who'd spent years fighting crankshaft failures weren't eager to trust another 20-cylinder design. The institutional knowledge of the SD45 disaster spread through the industry like a warning. The SD45-2 should have been a success. It incorporated everything EMD had learned from the original's failures. The modular Dash 2 electrical system was a genuine improvement. The strengthened crankcase eliminated the structural problems. The locomotive worked exactly as it was supposed to work. Only 136 SD45-2s were ever built. The SD42, with its boring 16-cylinder engine, sold nearly 4,000 units. It became the most successful locomotive in American history. Railroad after railroad chose reliability over raw power, proven performance over paper specifications. The SD45's shadow made them cautious. The cruelest irony came decades later, when the SD45's reputation outlived its actual problems. By the 1980s, EMD had completely solved the 20-cylinder engine's reliability issues. Marine applications ran 20-cylinder 645s for years without major failures. Nuclear power plants used them as emergency backup generators, trusting them to start instantly after sitting idle for months. The engine that had failed so spectacularly in locomotive service worked perfectly when it wasn't being bounced down railroad tracks. Railroad mechanical officers knew this. Some of them had worked on the improved 20-cylinder engines and seen how reliable they'd become. But institutional memory is powerful. The phrase 20-cylinder problems had become shorthand for engineering disaster. No purchasing agent wanted to explain to their board why they'd bought locomotives with that reputation. Wisconsin Central eventually operated the largest fleet of SD45s in America. Over a hundred secondhand units bought cheaply from railroads that wanted nothing to do with them. WC's mechanical department understood that the fixed engines were genuinely reliable. They installed modern Qtron control software that improved fuel consumption dramatically. They ran those problem locomotives on everything from intermodal to coal service. Then CN bought Wisconsin Central in 2001. The new owners immediately retired the entire SD45 fleet. Dozens of perfectly functional locomotives were scrapped because their model number carried too much historical baggage. The SD40S built in the same era are still running. Over a thousand SD42s remain in active service more than 50 years after the first one left Lagrange. They've been rebuilt, upgraded, and passed from railroad to railroad, earning their keep decade after decade. The locomotive that wasn't powerful enough to make headlines was reliable enough to make history. Great Northern 400, Hustle Muscle, the first SD45 ever built, still exists. It's owned by the Great Northern Railway Historical Society, preserved as a monument to an era when raw horsepower mattered more than anything else. In active service on a heritage railroad, Hustle Muscle ran for years with its original 20-cylinder engine. Then, inevitably, the crankshaft failed. The same failure mode that plagued the SD-45 fleet in the late 1960s took down the very first production unit, decades after the problem was supposedly solved. BNSF Railway donated a replacement engine in 2019, a 20-cylinder 645 from a retired Santa Fe SD-45-2, overhauled and ready for service. The locomotive that started the SD-45 story needed a transplant from a locomotive that ended it. Some railroad historians see poetry in that moment, others see tragedy. The SD-45 represented EMD at the peak of its confidence, convinced that engineering ambition could overcome any obstacle. That confidence built an empire. It also planted the seeds of the company's eventual decline. 
The same institutional arrogance that pushed the 20-cylinder engine into production before it was ready would later rush the 265H four-stroke engine to market in the SD90 Mac. That disaster was even more catastrophic, destroying EMD's reputation so completely that General Motors sold the division to private equity. Today, EMD survives as a subsidiary of Caterpillar, holding roughly 30% of a market it once dominated absolutely. The path from industry leader to also ran started with a crankshaft. The SD45 wasn't a bad locomotive. In many ways, it was ahead of its time. The horsepower it delivered in 1966 wouldn't be matched by reliable designs for another 20 years. The railroads that learned to work with its limitations found it could pull trains that nothing else in their fleet could handle. When the mechanical problems were eventually solved, the locomotive proved itself capable of decades of productive service. But the SD45 taught American railroads a lesson they never forgot. Raw power means nothing without reliability. The locomotive that was supposed to revolutionize freight operations became a cautionary tale about engineering hubris. The extra 600 horsepower that EMD promised was real, but it came with maintenance costs that erased any operational savings. The prestigious flagship of EMD's locomotive line became the machine that mechanical departments dreaded seeing in their shops. Railroads learned to be skeptical of specifications that looked too good on paper. They learned to wait for second-generation designs that had the bugs worked out. They learned that the best locomotive wasn't the most powerful one. It was the one that started every morning, ran every mile, and came home every night without breaking down. EMD learned those lessons too, eventually. The SD40-2 that emerged from the SD45's shadow was everything the SD45 should have been. Powerful enough for any task, reliable enough to trust, efficient enough to make money. It succeeded precisely because it didn't try to be revolutionary. It just tried to be exactly right. But EMD would forget those lessons. The same company that built the SD40-2 would later build the SD90 Mac, repeating every mistake of the SD45 with even more catastrophic results. The institutional memory that should have protected them faded as engineers retired and executives changed. The crankshaft disaster of the 1960s became ancient history until the engine disaster of the 1990s proved that history repeats itself. The trains still roll across America, the freight still moves, and somewhere in a museum or on a heritage railroad, an SD-45 with its distinctive flared radiator still runs, a monument to an era when EMD believed bigger was always better. 1,200 SD-45s were built. Most have been scrapped, rebuilt with 16-cylinder engines, or converted to unrecognizable configurations. The few survivors carry the scars of decades of modifications designed to make them reliable enough to trust. The SD-45's legacy isn't the locomotives themselves. It's the lesson they taught an industry about the limits of engineering ambition. More horsepower sounds better in sales meetings than it performs in service. Revolutionary designs make headlines. Reliable designs make profits. The locomotive that changes everything isn't always the locomotive that works. The numbers tell a brutal story. EMD built over 1,200 SD-45s. They built fewer than 140 SD-45s when they fixed the problems, but they built nearly 4,000 SD-42s, the locomotive that didn't promise revolution, just reliable service. Those SD-42s are still running today. More than 1,000 remain in active service, hauling freight across North America more than 50 years after they first left Lagrange. They've outlived the railroads that bought them, outlived the executives who signed the purchase orders, outlived the mechanics who maintained them. Some SD-42s operating today have been in continuous service longer than most railroad employees have been alive. The SD-45s are mostly gone, scrapped, rebuilt beyond recognition, converted to 16-cylinder configurations that admit their original design was flawed. The few survivors are museum pieces or heritage railroad attractions, monuments to an era of engineering ambition that exceeded engineering capability. $800 million in SD-45s rolled out of Lagrange between 1965 and 1971. The crankshaft failures, the emergency repairs, the policy adjustments, the early retirements, by any reasonable accounting, the true cost of the SD-45 program exceeded anything EMD had projected. They called the first one hustle muscle. They should have called it a warning. The horsepower wars of the 1960s promised a future of unlimited power. The crankshaft disasters of the SD-45 proved that some promises come with costs nobody anticipated. 